let's get started. Welcome everyone. <laughs> Happy Earth Day. Um, I, we, you know, we, coincidentally, sort of coincidentally, our neighbors know that we're really into composting and, and they um, left this uh, article in our uh, mailbox that uh, was very fitting. It came from the New York Times just on the 18th of April, um, written by a woman named Jessica Stolzberg. I just wanted to start with it because it was um, it just, it, well, it fit the theme of, of why, why we're doing this <laughs> webinar. In these mounting weeks of self-isolation, many of us are seeking and finding solace in the natural world. For me, this comfort extends to my backyard composting, which thrives as my family eats and snacks through each day at home, now and into a near future that unfurls with uncertainty. I've never considered our food supply chain so intensely. Where our sustenance comes from, whether there will be enough through this crisis, who touches it before it gets to us, and if our heroic grocers are being properly compensated, and how we should handle it once it's home. We now wash our fruits and vegetables with soap and water. I take this one more step beyond our nourishment and deliver what we don't consume back to the earth. And I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit. Earth Day this year will be without gatherings. To celebrate at home, consider keeping your first banana peel out of the garbage. I promise it will feel good and meaningful, both in the here and now and well beyond. Composting allows for a connection to food, to waste, to nature breaking things down just as intended, and to the revelry that comes with allowing it to happen. When we emerge from the turmoil of this pandemic, perhaps scathed but no less able, may we maintain our enhanced connection and take seriously our responsibility to this planet and its soil. Um, so my name's Kirsten Cho. This is my son, uh, and um, I'm a member of the Sustainable Fairfield Task Force. Um, we're a group, a voluntary group of, of residents in the town, um, and we participate in a wide range of initiatives around sustainability throughout Fairfield. Um, and that can mean a lot of things. We, we work on projects relating to renewable energy, waste reduction, air quality, food, local food systems, equity, and much more. Um, and we're gonna, we have three wonderful panelists today um, joining us on this webinar. I'm gonna introduce Mary first because you'll see she's our queen. Mary <laughs> is on the Sustainable Fairfield Task Force. Uh, with me and um, I crowned her the Queen of Earth Day um, because uh, well if you've if you've ever met Mary you know that Mary is the champion um, for the for sustainability initiatives in Fairfield <laughs> and she has many worm bins and she has uh, lots of compost um, but Mary and one of our um, uh, participants who's listening, Larry, um, are both on the task force and uh, also spearheaded this whole virtual Earth Day um, idea. Um, we were meant to have an in-person Earth Day celebration at the at the Y this year that that Mary and Larry have been doing for many years, um, and and they really um, pushed the task force to decide to take this virtual virtually and everyone rallied around and pulled it together in I, 10, 10 days, I think. <laughs> so um, she is the queen. She also is a, a Yukon trained master gardener and, um, and master composter. So she's gonna talk to us about her composting setup. We also have as a panelist, Dan Martins. Um, Dan is a, also a Fairfielder and master composter, and he's got some um, exciting, um, uh, an exciting vision to share um, for what could be in the world of, of food waste recycling and what is already happening in other parts of the world. And last but not least, we have <laughs> my son. What's your name? Um. Espen. And Espen is a budding vermicomposter. That's an that's a word that you'll get familiar with today, vermicomposter. 
and our hats are a little clue for what that word might mean. Mm. And he's gonna show you his setup at home. So with that, I'm gonna um, start sharing my screen, which has some slides, and Mary, mm. you can take over. For the first part. <laughs> yes. Not for the whole thing. Okay. Present. Yeah, I'm sorry. I just, mm. There we go. There we go. Finally. <laughs> Yay. Yay. <laughs> okay, so there, are, there we are. Um, so we're going to talk about composting with my special friends, Esmond and his worm friends, and Dan uh, Martins. So next. So there's several different kinds of composting. There's aerobic composting, which, as you can see down below, means it's related to involving or requiring free oxygen, which is what the Oxford Dictionary says. So it means that you need air. And this is the kind of composting that you do at home in your backyard bin or compost pile. And it's usually the kind of composting that they do in commercial composting facilities, but not always. So there are three, well, four things that you need to do, need to have when you're composting. You need to have three to one browns, which are the dry components. Those are the carbon. Um, components and uh, to every one greens or wet or uh, nitrogen components by volume or by site. And I'm very um, loosey-goosey about this stuff. You can, it, and that's how you can be when you're at home. When you're in the commercial um, industry, you're, you're, it's a science and you have to be very specific. Um, but when you're at home, as my sign or my scepter said, compost happens. So uh, it's going to happen whether you do it right or wrong. So um, you need airspace, which is uh, oxygen, and you need moisture. So really, what you need in your compost pile is what you need for yourself. You need food and um, for your energy source, you need oxygen and you need water or moisture, and you need some patience. So composting is um, something that is ex an acceleration of a natural process. So if you want it to go faster, you can keep working at it to get it to go faster, but uh, sometimes it doesn't go as late as you like. So next slide will, so compost will happen, but sometimes it doesn't happen the right as you like it to. So if it smells bad, it's probably too wet. It's probably gone anaerobic, which we'll talk about in a second. So if that's the case, throw in some of those browns, which are the dry components, which is our carbon. It'll dry it out, but you have to mix it all up. And you always have to mix up your, your compost whenever you throw anything in it, and just in general. And that also will then help with the aeration because as compost sits uh, around, it goes, it uh, settles and it squishes out those air pockets. So the mixing is not just to um, get everything all together and, and get everything mixed around. It also creates those air pockets, which are very, very important. If it's too dry, you can water it down or you can add greens because greens are wet. But again, you want to mix it up and create also create those air pockets. So um, when you're doing aerobic composting, that's also considered hot composting, or at least that's what you're aiming for. That's what's speeding up the process. So what's actually happening is uh, there are microorganisms that are in on on all these different things that you're throwing into the bin. And they're, they're busy eating up the things that you're throwing into your compost pile. And they're eating um, from the outside in of all those little pieces that you're throwing into your compost pile. So the smaller the pieces that you throw into your compost pile, the quicker the um, compost will degrade or, or decompose. So to do hot composting, it's necessary to get your pile up to 160 degrees Fahrenheit for three consecutive days. To do that, you need to have a pile that's at least three cubic yards in volume, which basically means that's just not gonna happen at home. So you don't, you're not gonna get it to a hot composting range. Um, that's what they're gonna do at the commercial facilities and they're gonna have way bigger than three cubic yards in volume. Um, and um, Dan is very familiar with commercial composting. So Dan, if there's anything you want to jump in and unmute and talk about anything on the way, please feel free because 
we're zooming through stuff. So you know, I, I'm sorry, can I just jump in? I, I also forgot to mention um, for anyone that's on the Zoom call, there's a Q&A box you can um, pop a question into if it comes up. We're gonna, we'll have time later to um, answer any of those questions that you type. Okay, thank you. That's a good point. Oh, oh, did you want to mention anything, Dan, about the hot composting or aerobic composting? Um, no, I just think that, um, you know, the, the anaerobic is a two-step process where they uh, use non, they don't use air, but they get to make uh, methane gas, which can then be used to make electricity or to make biogas for trucks. And then after that, then what's left goes into the traditional composting. So they're sort of tied together, uh, or at least they should be. So one's just an, an added step to the other. R right. So uh, yeah, as Dan was pointing out, but uh, so anaerobic is without air. So that that top level, I don't know if Esben, you want to walk us through that. We had talked about this um, before. Do you want to point out all the different steps? It looks like first uh, truck dumps all the compost into entrance bunker it looks like and then it goes up like a little trailer or a conveyor belt conveyor belt and then he's someone is like taking out all the stuff that wouldn't belong inside compost and then i guess it gets filtered into something and then and it, it says a drum filter mm -hmm. and then goes up another conveyor belt into a silo. silo and then and then it goes down out of the silo because there's like a spinny thing that makes it go out and, and can, can i just mention we talked about yesterday why it's going through all those steps what why are they doing all that work to filter and and why is that guy picking out stuff what are they doing because they're trying to get out the biogas well they're they're picking out the things that don't belong right remember? yeah yeah but right so the bioreactor remember what did we say that that was we're they're trying to pretend it's our stomach, right? Isn't it, it's just a mm -hmm. big, they're trying to make it act like our, our own it's stomach. So they're di it's a digester. Mm -hmm. And then... And so that, that biogas up there that's going out to the left, that's mm -hmm. what Dan was talking about. Right, Dan? Correct, 100%. And that gas you were saying can be used for um, energy. Mm -hmm energy or they can use it for biogas to put in trucks for the trucks to go out in the street and collect. So there's a couple of uses for it, make electricity from it. So, and then they, they have that sludge pump. So they're trying to collect the sludge mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. screw press is getting rid of all the, the water, right? We don't need the water. We want to compost mm -hmm. the solids. Mm-hmm. And then it goes down, and then it like gets crushed. It mixes. It gets mixed, mixed with garden waste and air, and then the trucks just put it in a pile for the people to collect. It goes through some aerobic composting processes, like tunnel composting, and then tunnel composting, and then see that keyword. At the bottom, air. Mm -hmm. We're off to aerobic mm -hmm. composting. Aerobic. And then where would it go? Where would these piles go? Well, who would who would use it? Um, I would. <laughs> uh, and they would want it. anyone who wants to grow some plants, farms, or people people for their gardens. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Ooh, who does vermicomposting on this call? <laughs> <laughs> vermicomposting can be done inside like your, home. your home. So verm means worm. Because <laughs> it sounds like worm. Yeah, exactly. 
You want to talk about these little guys, your so buddies? These are red wigglers, wigglers. Um, and what's their scientific name? Yesenia fatata. Fatida. Fatida. <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard to say. It's hard to say. Do you remember what, what that word fatida Stinky. Means? Stinky. So if you treat them not, not nice or not, like if you don't treat them well, then they can give a stink off. Yeah. We've never smelled it because we're so kind and gentle with our words. <laughs> You want to read these sentences? They are not typically found in your backyard and not well suited for outdoor compost piles. They thrive in warm conditions and are ideal for indoor vermicomposting. They stay on the top layer of the soil and therefore would freeze outside in the climate. So you're not going to find these in your backyard bins, but they're perfect for your indoor bin. Mm -hmm. Earthworms. So these are worms that, these are one of the worms that you, you would likely find in your backyard um, bin. Mm -hmm. There's many, there are many types of earthworms. This is a common one called Lumbricus terrestris. Um, they're adapted to thrive in, your, in the outdoors. And then you want to read that last sentence? They will burrow deep in the ground if conditions are too dry or too cold. So that's how they survive the winters. <clears throat> Another one that you would find or use for fishing is night crawlers. They're, they can be very big. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you want to read this? this their tunnels help to aerate soil and help bring oxygen to plants roots and allow plants growth. They will burrow deep in the ground when temperature climb, climb over 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh, they don't like it too hot, huh? No. Mm. Um, who are these guys? <laughs> <laughs> That's my red wiggle list. Of course, it's not all of them. <laughs> so we're gonna. Um, these are these are just some of Espen's worms. Yes, yeah, so we're we're gonna take a look at his setup. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now, and then Espen will walk you through his worm setup. Might be helpful to be on speaker view for this if you're on Zoom, so it's big enough for you to see. Okay. So what's that green thing, Espen? So this is a bin. Worm bin, yeah. And it has these holes for ventilation. Mm -hmm. And inside here, you can see, it looks regular, just like regular dirt. And you want to show how you feed them? So if you want to feed them, you just take a little hole. And then you can just take a scoop of some food scraps and just pull them in. Just like that. And then cover it back up. So we tend to try to chop our food scraps up into little little pieces to increase their surface area and help them break down faster so that the worms can get to work on the on the bacteria oh espen is your take a sniff is your bin stinky uh not really it what smells is, actually sweet it smells a little sweet it smells like candy sometimes smells like candy <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's great. Uh, we usually keep our worm bin in the basement because mm -hmm. the, the conditions down there are kind of perfect. They like the dark and mm -hmm. they like cool temperatures, right? Mm -hmm. But we brought it up here so that it would be a little bit easier to see in the light of our dining room. Oh, you want to talk about that? So this is one of the trays. And you can see that it has a grid. So the grid is for, so if there's like, so 
You can have the grid so there is food on the top. Or if there's food on the bottom, then they finish on that, then all the compost is down there. So when they move to the top, then, then they have nice food up there. More fresh food. Mm -hmm. So there's different layers of our bin. And the top layer is where we put our food scraps. And as the top layer starts to get turn more from worms and food scraps into nice vermicompost, then they move down. Then we'll put a new tray up on top. There's, there's our older tray. That is a nice tray of vermicompost. And um, pretty soon we'll take that out to our garden and the worms are going to migrate up into the upper layers to get to the fresh food scraps. But if you don't have a, a bin like this that's designed for vermicomposting, Espen's going to show you how you can set up a very simple bin at home. That, that, that uh, probably with, a, with a, a plastic bin you might already have. So you can take some dirt. Well, of course we have like wigglers in here, but you can take this one or whatever you want. Well, we want to use red wigglers for the indoor one. Yeah. Yes. And then, so you take your dirt and you can just pour it in the middle. It's okay if you, you don't have to spread it around yet. And then you can just. You want to show a few worms in there? So here's this one, and here's a big one. Okay. And here's a baby one. Oh, teeny. <laughs> <laughs> and so you can just spread that around. The dirt with the linen ones. It doesn't have to be all over. There's your scraps. Got some food scraps. Some chips, <laughs> yeah. some cucumbers, some onion shells. Okay. Uh, you can show that if you if you if you need a little moisture, you can just spritz a little water on there. It's helpful if your water has has been sitting out for a while, so it's not um, chlorinated. Then you can take some strip paper and just like, you know, just like put it on the top. Shredded paper is good bedding and it helps keep um, air available for the worms because they do need oxygen. Mm -hmm. But you don't want to put it on the bottom. Right. And it's a, also a great biofilter, which, which is a fancy way of saying it, it um, will keep anything that is stinky kind of mm. in underneath it so that um, it'll not smell up wherever you keep your bin. So while Espen's finishing that up, we also prepared, we thought it would be interesting to show um, Closer up, if we can, of uh, some of his worm. When you have a worm bin, and um, so, well, let me back up. We got our worms from Mary, <laughs> these red wigglers. But what's fun is they, you know, they come in and and they just are. They're very prodigious reproducers. So right in your bin, they're going to start reproducing, and you will see all the stages of life. And here's some eggs. It's hard for me to tell if you can see that. Pull it back. Pull it back more. Yeah, there you go. There you go. So these little yellow thing, yellowish things here, they look like teeny tiny lemons. Those are the eggs of the red wigglers. And I didn't want I wanted to show you some teeny babies. They're of course they're hiding in this 
pile of if you want, I can get compost. Some. Let's be. Oh, look, that one's crawling out right now. Move your fingers so they can see. There's one. Oh. Okay, let's just keep it on the. <laughs> There's a teeny weeny one. Wait, dude. What's the name, Aspen? Which one is that? Wait, I think that is. The chart is there. <laughs> Baby Victor, which is Vic and Black. Baby. Vic and Vax, Baby Victor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and now we also, in this, here, hang on a second. You want to hold your hand out, Wei Wei? Hold Here's an hand. adult one. Here's a nice big one. Little, little, oh, wow. Is that Vic, Vax? Wait, let me see. <laughs> no, it's not July because she's huge. We didn't find her today. <laughs> uh, maybe she's it. It's Johnny. Johnny is the second biggest. Okay, it's Johnny. <laughs> he is long. He's gonna have a baby one day. <laughs> Why don't you put Johnny back in the in one of your bins? Okay. Okay. We'll go back to um to our slides now. Someone asked if the paper was recycled paper. It. So what we have, what we used is regular office paper, shredded. Office. <laughs> okay, we're gonna start sharing our screen again. No, not that. Where's our slideshow? We're gonna have our slideshow in about. There it is. Hi, we go. Okay, so we have some que some questions of yours that might be answered, but if they don't get answered, feel free to let us know. Um, we kind of talked about this, why you'd want to set up vermicomposting indoors. Your outdoor bin, is it, does it work very well in the winter? Um, yes, I mean, it doesn't really, but sometimes it works a little well. Ours kind of does work sort of in the winter, our outdoor bin, mm -hmm. because we have probably because we haven't had a whole lot of cold weather these past few winters. But typically what happens is the worms burrow down deep where it's warmer and they're, and they're not in your bin working on your food scraps. So if you want to compost in the winter, indoors well, is ideal. The outdoor bin is the it's, it's the bacteria that's doing the composting, and they're they're going dormant, so it's the it's too cold for them to really break down the compost. So mm -hmm. that's what's slowing down. We talked about number two too. What kind of worms are best? The red wigglers, and where do we get them? Well, we got ours from Mary, but Mary will talk about where she got hers from. In a few slides ahead. Of yeah, <laughs> we'll have a drum roll when we see that slide. And anybody who's listening and knows us, we'd be happy to give you some of our red wigglers if you want to start a bin. Mm -hmm. What kinds of food scraps can I compost in a worm bin and how to keep it from being stinky? Well, Mary talked about the biofilter and that's part of how you keep it from being stinky. Mm -hmm. You also want to keep it from getting too wet to keep it from being stinky. But what kind of food scraps do we put in? Well, we put in like I would say vegetable peels. Yeah. Fruit Not banana peels. Banana peels you can. However, what did Mary tell us you have to do first? Uh, freeze them. Freeze them first so that you don't get fruit flies. Right. You want to kill the fruit fly larvae before you put them in. I learned the hard way. <laughs> <laughs> And what did we talk about freezing in general? What does that do to the, the um, food? Do you remember? Are you listening to the question? Mm -hmm. you do, do you remember? I remember. No. It starts to starts to, the process of the food breaking down faster, mm -hmm. so that kind of speeds speeds it up, so it's ready for the worms, right? Yeah, it really beats up the cells of the of the. Um, food scraps mm -hmm. it destroys those cells so when they start to then um you know defrost they're really really broken down so they the bacteria just can devour them so mm. um we did 
Uh, oh, I think, well, we talked about you want to steer clear of things that are oily, meats, things like that, but vegetable scraps are good. We've done bread in there. We did have one mold overgrowth when we didn't bury the bread deep enough, but you can do um, bread, I think, if you're, if you're a little more diligent about digging it down. Yeah. Um, how do I har harvest compost from my worm bin? Well, you have to take the worms out. That's one <laughs> way to do it. You can physically and then you just separate. take all the stuff out and then put new dirt in. Yeah. Um, or Mary has, a, they, oh, they don't like light, so Mary has some tricks for harvesting them. Yeah, they oh, don't like shine a light on them, and then they'll go to the next tray and then take all that out. Anytime yeah. you shine a light on them, they're going to want to go away from the light. So you could uh, use like a flashlight to help you separate the worms from the vermicompost. Mm -hmm. Or they don't like um, vibration. Oh, right. On top of the washing, what did you say? The washing machine? The dryer. Yeah. The dryer. Yeah. Um, what should I do with the compost? What do we do with compost? What? What do we do with the compost? Um, we usually put it in our garden. Because plants love worm poop. <laughs> worm poop. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've included some of some our books. favorite books. books. Um, Espen and I read Worms Eat My Garbage when we first started setting up our worm bin, and that was very helpful. Oh, God. One of his favorite books from his childhood is Diary of a Worm, which is definitely... A little more not scientific. Not scientific, but it's well, very entertaining. Yes. And then we th put a link into that nice article that I started the webinar with. All of these slides, by the way, will be available on our... Um, Sustainable Fairfield uh, website websites for, for future reference. Mm -hmm. Okay. Where where did Mary get her red wigglers? Here you go. <laughs> Someone asked this question. So the Worm Ladies of Charleston in Rhode Island. And um, you have to be careful where you get your red wigglers from because there is an invasive type of worm that some uh, people who say they're selling you red wigglers um, will send you. So these folks are the ones that the Yukon um, master composters tell you to go to. So I would strongly suggest only going to these folks. Okay. Now we're gonna hear from from Dan. Yeah, hello. Dan the man. Are we gonna hear are we gonna hear you and see you? There we're gonna see you. Hey, there he is. It's your choice. <laughs> no voting, please. <laughs> <laughs> but um, what I wanted to do is Mary asked me, it's been asked me if I could talk a little bit about um, what people do around the world. And it's very interesting to know that in Connecticut we have about five hundred thousand um, tons of food scraps. Now, how much is that? Know what it is? It's a whole lot. It's a whole lot of it. And it's not garbage, it's resource. So it's what we're showing here is that it's something that the earth has done forever. They take the food scraps and turn it back into good nutrients for the soil and grow crops. However, we decide to get in the way of it and turn it into garbage, which really is a waste and it really is going against what the earth would do on its own. So um, it's scalable though. So it just depends where you are. So if you work, if you're, maybe you live in an apartment and you don't have a backyard or you're in a school, you can still do vermicomposting like Spin did, you know, and use your food scraps to make some good compost. Um, if you're in an apartment, um, maybe you have a little yard with a bunch of other people, you could do a community composting. Or if you have a house with a little yard, you could do home composting, which is, which is good. However, what if you live in the city? Because uh, where all these food scraps are, where the people are, is where the people are making food scraps. So for um, 
uh, people who live in the city, uh, they have what's called curbside pickup. And that's when the cities actually uh, come by and they pick up the food scraps just like they would pick up the garbage. And you have to separate your food scraps and you put them on the curb when they get picked up. So depending on where you are and what your situation is, everybody can participate in like turning their food waste, their food scraps into compost and putting it back on the soil. So um, what do they do? So um, basically to have large programs for cities, they have the cities have put in programs for um, picking up people save, have a little bit in their house and they collect their food scraps. So then once a week, they put them out and they get picked up. Um, and they go to very large composting facilities, as Mary talked about, the aerobic ones or the anaerobic composting plants. And um, the anaerobic composting plant that Mary showed, there is one like that in Connecticut. And in Connecticut, he oh. takes about 40,000 tons of those 500,000 tons and he makes enough electricity for about 800 homes in an hour. So that's a lot of electricity he makes. But in Italy, where I go and visit many times and look at places, um, they have a composting plant there that takes 600,000 tons of material. And that's enough to be all, that's more than Connecticut, everybody in Connecticut even makes. So it's really large and that's only one. And they have several uh, plants that compost. So I thought what we'd do is take a look at what some curbside programs look like, um, the way they do it in there, because it's on a very large scale, is they have what are called uh, vented uh, kitchen pails. They call them kitchen catchers, um, and they collect the food scraps in compostable bags. They use the compostable bags there because they don't let the, the stuff doesn't smell, and then when the people pick it up, it doesn't leak. Um, and then it's just done on a regular basis. And then in Italy in particular, we're gonna look at the city of Milan. What they do in Milan is they actually have a contract with the farmers. So it's a big, as they call, they call it a circular bioeconomy. So that people collect their food scraps, um, they get their compostable bags and bins from the grocery stores. Uh, the composters composted make nutrients and then the farmers actually have contracts to take the, the compost and they can um, spread it on their fields. And then people who contribute in the city, they get free compost back so that they can use it in their gardens, uh, on their balconies in the city. So I said, let's take a quick look. So I got a little video to share that's uh, from Milan and um, the way they do it in Italy. And Milan is the world model they collect most food scraps from any other city in the world. They have the lowest contamination. Um, they also get the, the, the most actual output for the, for the actual compost. So they get the most food scraps, the least contamination. Um, but Italy is not the only one. So I said, let's do the continental because they do similar things in Italy, France, Spain, and Germany. However, it's not just Europe because Seattle, San Francisco too, and even New York City, and even some places like Minnesota and Vermont and places around, but we're gonna look at it on a big scale. So when they do the Continental, they make it easy to do. So if you wanna take a look at the video, we'll just watch it and then we can ask, talk about it later. Oops, sorry. That was a quick video. <laughs>
at all those bags. Ooh, that's a lot of food screen. Compost. There's the farmers. There's the rest of them. Okay, so that's kind of how it how it works now. It's like I said, that's the state of the art. Um, they try to have everybody make it. They try to have everybody collect the food scraps, so they try to make it easy for people, um, and then they try to make sure it gets back in the soil to the farmers to help grow more crops. So whether you're doing it your very first worm bin, or if you're in a participating in a big city where they have municipal composting, it's all the same thing. At the end, we're trying to take those food scraps, which nature provides to us. It gives us the fruit and the food to eat. And then all we can do is give the rest of it back to the soil. And um, you can do anything, but the main thing is just to get started. And, uh, and Espen was very good to show us how much fun it can be, even with a worm bin or a home composter. Um, I like to do them all, but um, I only have so many food scraps in my house as well. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you. Um, So we have two um, uh, co companies that do curbside pickup of compost in Fairfield. There's Action Container Service and Curbside Compost. So if you don't want to do composting at home, they will take you collect your, your compost at home. So you take your organics and they will actually also take um, meat and fish and that sort of thing that you wouldn't want to compost in your home composting. And they will pick up your compost bin and they will take it away and give you, I actually, Dan, you probably know better how they do it because I compost at home. I don't know how the service works, but um, they, sure. yeah, well, you want to explain how it goes? Yeah, well, they, well these are, um, their subscription services. So what they do is you basically have a, a, a bin, just like they do this in New York City too, um, um, where you, you collect your food scraps at home and you put them out at the curb and they come and they pick them up and then they take all of them up to the composter. And there's a couple of them, there's about four different composters in, in Connecticut. Uh, there's also the anaerobic digester, but most folks from around here wouldn't cart it that far. That's up in the central part of the state. Um, and then they make good nutrients, uh, good soil amendments from the compost. But you can give them a call. This one does have a fee. It's not like the big city programs where they actually drop off. And um, you know, even in New York City, they have the community composters, we're gonna talk about it, but some of the food markets, um, you actually could bring your scraps to the food market in a compostable bag and drop them off. And then when you buy your fruits and vegetables, you get another bag. So that's how they do it in the city because it's a little Ooh. hard to carry your fruits from in your hand. So you have to get it picked up. <laughs> I, um, I see that Nicola is on the, um, our attendee list and I've uh, allowed her to talk. Nicola, do you want to explain? She works at Container Action, Con Action Container Service. Nicola? I can't hear you. You're unmuted. No? Hello. <laughs> oh, maybe that's the wrong Nicola. Never mind. <laughs> okay. Okay. Next screen. 
Some additional helpful resources that, uh, that Mary put together. Um, and the links will be available uh, for anyone who comes and finds our slideshow on that, that we'll post on the uh, Sustainable Fairfield Task Force website. For anyone who's interested in really digging deep, there's links to the um, Master Composter and Master Gardener programs that Mary and Dan, Mary and Dan have uh, attended and graduated from. Maybe something for your future, huh? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, Mary, mm -hmm. I, I can't quite see the q and I don't know if you are able to, if there's any... Um, we have one question thus that we haven't answered from Gary Marshall. What is an example of something that wouldn't belong in the compost bin? Do I have to worry about what I put in my curbside compost when they pick it up? Do you want to talk sure. about what belongs in the compost bin? Yep. Um, with the curbside pickup, but it's the same thing with your home composting. You want to make sure that you only put, um, if you can, food scraps in there. Um, you want to put um, paper. You can take, it will take some, uh, when I hate not newspaper, but if you have like a napkin or something like anything that's food soiled that can't go into the recycling bin, you can do that. Uh, you can, depending on commercial, you check, check with your, your hauler, your micro hauler, and see if they'll take meats and if they'll take fish or what they'll take. Uh, most of them will because they do the um, um, thermophilic uh, hot compost. So that will, will take care of that. What you don't want to put in and really be careful is you don't want to put any plastic in there. And by plastic, I mean uh, not compostable plastic like a bag, but the uh, you don't want to throw anything plastic in there, any wrap. You certainly want to make sure don't let anything sharp fall in. Like I've actually seen some bags that come from the supermarkets and one actually had a butcher knife in it. And you have to remember that the folks that handle this, the composters, the composters, they're farming that material uh, to the micro, it, micro bacteria. And the worst thing is to reach in there and get cut or one of them to get hurt. So really be careful. Now in Milan, they get down to a 4% contamination rate. And they go through and they check. But even there, you see that some people in the big cities, they'll put even like diapers in there or they'll put tin foil or a can or, you know, any kind of plastic wrapping. You don't want to put any of that in there because that won't be composted and it becomes contamination. And that's truly garbage. So we want to avoid that. So if you're collecting in your home, it's really easy. If you have a separate bin, you just know that anything that goes in there, table scraps or food cuttings should just be the food itself. But it's for municipal, it's pretty, it's pretty open, but check with your, with your composter. Did that answer the question? I think so. Um, anybody else have any questions? I, I'll keep waiting. I wanted to also note that, um, there is a lot of composting going on in public and private schools in the area. And we are hoping, I'm not sure how this pandemic will affect our efforts, but the plan uh, had been that we would start composting in Fairfield Public Schools starting in the fall with a pilot at Sherman School, uh, which is really exciting. What we do in Connecticut is we uh, burn our garbage. Um, so. It, if you think about it, um, we talked about um, uh, how composting is browns, which are, which are um, dry, and greens, which are wet. So these organics are considered green. They're wet. So, you know, I always ask people, would you ever take a head of lettuce and throw it into your fireplace? That, that would be kind of silly, right? That's a very wet thing. You would not want to do that. So it doesn't make sense to take all these green, organic, wet things and try and burn them. So um, taking them out of the waste stream, and I think that's about 30%, right? Isn't that, Dan, of the waste stream is organics? By weight, so yeah. That, that takes a lot of uh, stress out of our uh, incinerators, which are very old. They're pretty much at or past their, their expected life um, expectancy. So that really would save a lot in terms of um, the stress on them. 
So um, hoping that we can continue with the pilot at Sherman and then keep rolling it out to all our other schools. Wilton, um, I think, is the first one in Fairfield County. They, I think they're on their third year of, of composting in all their schools. And um, it's been uh, taking off on other schools locally to us. So that's something we're gonna look forward to here in Fairfield. We have a couple of new questions. Um, do you think I would need to freeze all food scraps first to avoid the fruit fries or just banana skins? I only ever had a problem with banana skins and boy, did I have a huge problem. <laughs> um, but what uh, some people have told me is that they don't even have uh, their kitchen um, collection counter on their counter. They actually just keep a baggie in their uh, freezer and they freeze everything. Um, just because it, it so accelerates the process of breaking down the food scraps. I don't know if, uh, Dan, you've ever heard anybody. Well, I, I know that in New York City, people will put their food scraps in the refrigerator, but I thought that was just to store it. And when you told me about it breaking down, that makes total sense because it freezes the liquid in it, which breaks up the cells, which then kind of mush it up a bit. So that's really a good thing to do. I also had a mega fruit fly um, explosion. Uh, I had my worm bin in the in the basement, and I guess when I was starting out, I did, really wasn't covering it up. And I had to, boy, I was just chasing fruit flies for so long. And uh, so I made the little vinegar traps, you know, with the uh, plastic wrap on top and caught most of them and used the vacuum cleaner. But I kind of got a lot of, I got a lot of flack from everyone else. <laughs> What is that trick? Because that's an important one to know. If you're going to do indoor composting, what's that? that? Yeah, um, this is why you collect the fruit flies and you could do it even if you have regular fruit flies. You take a little bowl, you fill it up with vinegar um, or apple vinegar, you put a piece of a uh, cling wrap on top and you poke little holes in it with a fork and Ooh. then they climb in the holes to get to the vinegar and then they can't get out and then they get pickled and I think they die a very happy, a very happy life. <laughs> <laughs> a good end, a very happy end being pickled in the in the juice. But it just collects them. But it really, uh, I wasn't taking my food scraps like Ispen was doing and covering them over with some of the soil. So they were just on top. And I just, I got one, I got one start and I couldn't get rid of them. And I basically took them out to the garage and started covering them over the food scraps in my worm bin and they went away. So, but uh, yeah, that was, it was a good learning experience, I guess. Yeah, they're pretty prolific. Uh, uh in terms of regenerating. Um, that's why they use we them. For we haven't had a, a problem with them with our worm bin, but we've, we've had them in the summer with our scrap bin on the counter, the intermediate step. And I'm sure the banana peels were the culprit. <laughs> um, so one thing that I, um, we talked about the other day that I had learned when I went to the, um, from a composting conference with um, Rhonda a while back, Dan, mm -hmm. was that um, they had isolated two hormones that are only found in vermicomposting that are uh, really helpful for um, plant health. So vermicompost um, has something in it that nothing else has that is really helpful for plant health. So it's pretty exciting that, that and that, that was a few years ago, so they may have actually found more reasons that Vermicomposting is, uh, or vermicompost is super special stuff for your plants. And the yeah. other thing that sort of relates to a question someone has is, um, at that time, they said that you really only want 10%, at least of vermicompost, to 90% um, of your soil. That you don't want it to be all compost or all vermicompost. It just actually is too much. I don't know, Dan, if you know anything about that at all. Yes, usually, uh, it, even at the um, some of the larger scale vermicomposters, they'll sell their casings and then they'll mix it with other compost or other soil to make a, a recipe. And it goes that way, otherwise it can be a little rich. Now there's some industries that really use a lot of the worm casings um, depending on the crop. Uh, so it's a fairly, uh, when you're making a little bag of vermicompost casings, go look online because that little bag it cost like $30 if you were to go buy it. So it's those little worms work hard and uh, they get paid for it. So, or we get paid for it. It's, it's good stuff. And what about compost tea? We didn't actually have a slide about that, but do you want to talk about that? 
Well, yeah. Now, I guess there's a couple, and it was nice on Ispins. I saw he had the little little uh, drain on his, you know. Right. But I know that in my worm bin, I have the holes in the bottom. And just from the liquid that comes from all the um, food scraps, you know, like a lot of food scraps, like 80% water. So it all comes through and becomes the liquid, and it comes on the bottom. So what I would do is I just collect it in a jar, and... Um, you have to water it down because it's very strong. You don't want to put that just on the plants, but it's great for indoor plants. I actually put it on my um, rose bushes outside. I hope that's good. I did anyway. Nothing, nothing bad happened. Um, but you want to add water to it till it almost looks like the color of tea, so it's not too strong. There's probably people who know more technically how to do it, but that's what I was always taught, and I've done it a few times, and uh, and it's and it works very well, and it's a really good um, again, it's a really good um, nutrient to add to your soil, house plants or outdoor. Yeah. Um, any other questions from anyone? Oh, I wrote to myself. Sorry, Michaela. Sure. <laughs> I didn't write that answer to you. Um, so you want to use 10% compost to 90% soil. Yeah. Oh, Nicola had said, I'm here, couldn't figure out how to unmute. Yeah, I, what, what is your name of, oh, it is Nicola. Oh, I did unmute her and then I don't know what happened. Uh, do you want to try and unmute her? I don't see her anymore. Oh. Um, not the way that I have, I'm, I'm having trouble figuring out controls here while I'm screen sharing. <laughs> Oh, someone asked, can you make worm tea with the casings? Yes, that's basically what we're saying. Um, so you, you put, a, you know, just like a handful of, of the, the worm compost in a bucket of water. You can do that too. And then you have a whole bucket of worm tea. That's really, that's how I know how to do it. The other, the, the, the runoff from compost is actually... I've, I've heard is not really so much the tea as it is um, a wastewater thing. So yes. I don't know. We're not experts on the worm or the, the compost tea, it sounds like, <laughs> basically answer. Yeah, you can also make tea by uh, taking, basically you can make tea bags out of your compost and let it sit in water. And that will also make a tea, which you can do as well. Um, I think I saw somebody just said a question too, said, so you should only use 10% of your compost and 90% soil. Um, I don't know if that's a rule. Maybe you know. What I was talking about was basically adding casings to, um, to the compost to make a recipe. Um, what you basically do is you spread your, I think you just spread your compost out and work it into your soil. I mean, I don't think anybody here is going to over compost. Um, there is a possibility of doing that, but that's really at a large scale. That's really for, for crops. I don't think I'd worry about it for any uh, home, home uses. Right. Okay. Um, Open. I recently purchased compostable plastic cups on Amazon for a vent. Are they truly compostable? Dan, that's totally you. Oh, okay. Um, well, this is what you always want to look for, for compostable stuff is first of all, you want to find out they're certified. And for us, it's a BPI certification is pretty much the standard. So you want to make sure that they're BPI certified. Now, there's different types of items too. Um, it depends on what kind of material it is because not all the material is the same. So there's another certification called um, TUV Home Compostable. So you want to look on the same thing and see if it's home compostable. Now, uh, that means you, it should be able to compost in your home pile. Um, you don't use it for vermicomposting. I wouldn't use, there's been some studies on bioplastics and compostables and worm, but really there's no need for it. You know, I wouldn't even use it, you don't need to. Uh, if it's a bag and it says home compostable, it's fine. If it's a, uh, a cup, like a clear plastic cup, that's probably made of a material called PLA. And PLA is a different kind of material that needs to be hydrolyzed, which means it needs, it's like a piece of macaroni. It's got to get wet and it's got to get warm to turn nice and mushy so that it can be eaten by microbes. 
Um, so I would check with that. Um, and then also I would check with your um, municipal composter to see if they take them because it just depends on what they are. So even though it is compostable by certification, you wanna make sure that it can be composted. But hey, hats off to you for not buying something if it's not plastic. Um, if you wanna compost it, you could probably grind it up and put it in your compost bin. But um, you know, just try and see. We have one last question and then I think we'll end on this one um, from our co-chair of Earth Day, Larry Cayley. The common earthworm was brought to the new world by the early European settlers. We talked about that earlier. Are the red wrigglers native to this continent? Did we look that up? I don't remember. Do you know, Esben? Uh, we did I don't not. remember finding that info. I think they said the red wrigglers were green here. Yeah. Brought here? Yeah. I, I, I to here. be honest, do not know the answer to that. I don't but. think we found that on our in our research. We knew we knew the earthworm was um, European. We didn't find anything about whether the wrigglers were not or were or were not. We'll have to look and look at look that up, Larry. Yeah, they're not. I think what I heard is that they're, you know, they're not native, but they're not invasive either. So that's good. <laughs> good. I guess all you need is a good winter. <laughs> yeah, for sure. You're <laughs> Right, sorry. That's a fancy you. word for saying they can't, they stay in the top layer of the soil. So that's all the time we have for our, our session. So thank any, you all for joining us. And for anyone who wants to stick yes. around, we've got a special treat. You're welcome to pop off. We've, we're, we're, we're at the end of our hour, but we do have a special treat for anyone yes. who wants to stick around. Are you ready? Happy Earth Day, everyone. Happy Earth Day. Uh, thank you, Dan. Thank you. Happy Earth Day. Ready. Set, go. Uh -oh. I can't hear it. for the day. <laughs> yeah, you okay. That was fun, guys.
Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Everyone. Oh, Larry, you can tell the earthworm is European by their accent. <laughs> <laughs> Larry. <laughs> All right. Bye. See ya. Oh, we have to stop all this streaming okay. stuff. Yes. Bye, bye, bye. Bye, you got it.